Even when I was a little girl, it was an odd sight to watch my stepdad, Bob, nurture a garden. He kept three tall, stately rose bushes in the front yard of the house, a 1,200-square-foot bungalow. In the back, he tended to six or eight stubby bushes. It was an odd sight because Bob spent most of the rest of his free time nurturing macho hobbies, like tinkering with cars, watching football, and hawking loogies, <laughs> and yelling. My mother had started dating Bob six months after I was born, and they married just a few months after they had broken up when I was four years old. In one of the first pictures of us together, we are at the Renaissance Fair. It is 1982, and my mother and he have been dating for a few months. I'm wearing a white dress. He is holding me while wearing jorts and a cowboy hat. He's handsome, 5'11", so six foot, he would say. Dark brown hair under his hat, clean shaven. A man who was thin as a beanpole in his pictures as an 18-year-old US Navy enlistee but who by 1982 looked fit and trim in middle age. In the picture, it is hot and I have been crying. I am embarrassing my mother. I was not just crying because it was hot. I was crying because I was afraid of Bob. I was afraid of him for the rest of my childhood. To be fair, I was scared of a lot of things as a kid. Big dogs, roller coasters, elevators, even Santa. Then again, now that I'm a parent myself, I can confidently say that Bob was a terrible father. <laughs> Though he never laid a hand on me, he yelled a lot. He didn't think children should be seen and not heard was a cliche. He believed it. So he yelled pretty much whenever he heard me. Often he yelled even when he didn't hear me. Like the time during dinner when I ate all the peas on my plate first. Why are you eating like that? Why don't you eat a bite of each one? Furiously waving his fork and knife, he mimed the correct way. A bite of peas, then potato, then chop. He kept it up as I ate. My mom tried to placate him. Bobby, please. He waved his knife toward my pork chop. Can't you cut the pieces smaller? She got fed up. That's enough. Then he blew up about how my elbows were on the table. How many times do I have to tell you? By then, sniffling, I dared to yell back, stop it, and was sent to my room. Bob and I were at war, and that was my normal. I feared him, I fumed at him, but mostly I tried to avoid him. Like so many other men of his generation, he just didn't seem to have the knack for nurturing kids, and it didn't occur to him to try to learn. But. Roses were a different story. He nurtured his roses and they rewarded him by growing splendidly, full of life and Los Angeles sunshine. He tended to them year round, pruning the bushes, fertilizing the soil, trying various homemade and store-bought remedies to protect them from aphids and other pests. One year he released a container of live ladybugs on the bushes, an abject failure. I made wish after wish on as many ladybugs as I could as they flew away that afternoon. I wish I could think of the perfect comeback to shut up Kirsten. She was my school bully. And I wish we had the Disney Channel. I wish I was already a grown up. Bob grew his roses without advice or input from anyone that I could see. This was years before Google or YouTube. He had no friends. He didn't learn from books or magazines because he didn't read. Later on, I learned he had trouble reading, probably undiagnosed dyslexia. But as I was a bookworm, his lack of interest in reading was just one more reason to dislike him. He didn't learn how to take care of roses from my mother, who had lived in apartments her whole life and hadn't grown up with a yard. Where did he learn? He must have taught himself. Through trial and error over the years with patience and commitment, if not a perverted, then a diverted impulse to nurture, foster, and sustain. His roses grew in all different shades, yellow, peach, fuchsia, even white petals with red tips. Of course, I was not allowed to touch them, 
not at any stage, but especially not when they were budding. I get it now, the thorns, the fragile blossoms with their folded petals. None of that was a good match for a kiddo, not even for a prissy little kid like I was back then. My mother wasn't allowed to touch the roses either. They were Bob's, and Bob decided when to clip them. They blossomed into large bowls, nothing like the roses from the store or even from the florist. They smelled sweeter too and stronger, like the difference between a supermarket strawberry and one picked and eaten on a farm. Just three or four of his roses were fragrant enough to fill the kitchen with their scent. When I was nine, my mother had to work Saturdays. She only did that for a few months, but I clung to my mother back then. For a few Saturdays, Bob spent all his time outside while I sat in my bedroom watching TV or reading. But one Saturday, the man who couldn't remember what grade I was in, even though my mother and he were married for eight years, the man who growled at me for leaving my glasses on the bathroom counter, who slammed his fist on the table after I'd asked him if he'd had a bad day, this man said, get your shoes on. We're going to buy flowers for your mom. Bob was looking for roses. He knew my mother felt bitter about having to work on the weekend, and he wanted to get her long stem which were more sophisticated than what he grew at home. But if I know anything about Bob, I know he also wanted the best deal. So we drove to the legendary wholesale flower market in downtown LA. It was a 15 minute drive from our house back when LA traffic actually died down on the weekends. We walked into a huge warehouse with an abundant array of fresh flowers and plants. What is this place, I asked. I used to come here to buy flowers for the ambassador, he said. The ambassador was not a person, but a place, the ambassador hotel. He had worked there in the early 60s as a photographer's assistant. That was during its heyday when the ambassador housed the famous Coconut Grove nightclub and hosted the Oscars. Bob talked about the ambassador all the time. The celebrities he saw, John Wayne, Frank Sinatra, Don Rickles, when I was a kid, Bob was trapped in a dead-end job with a commute he hated, and he romanticized his time at the Ambassador. We made our way through the aisles and aisles of flowers in every color, every shape and size and arrangement imaginable. Like most nine-year-olds, I wasn't impressed. The fact that I never felt welcome in our rose garden at home made me even less curious. It was also freezing in the warehouse. My upper arms were all goosebumps under my t-shirt. I'm cold, I whined, but he ignored me and focused on his mission, finding a vendor with red long stem roses. Once he chose, the vendor wrapped 24 dripping stems in the previous day's LA Times. He also wrapped a bundle of baby's breath in a sheet of newspaper. Bob let me carry that. As we rode home, he gestured vaguely toward Boyle Heights. I lived there during the war with my mom, he said. He was referring to World War II when he would have been 10 or 11. Bob had never talked to me about his mom before. All I knew about her was a framed 5 by 7 studio photo he kept by the phone. I would stare at it while lying down in the hallway, chatting to my grandma or my friends in the very old days, not just before cell phones, but before cordless home phones. <laughs> The photo of his mom was posed. She wore a suit jacket with a wide lapel like the ones Rosalind Russell wore in His Girl Friday. Her waves of dark hair were held back by, from her face by a side comb. The photo was black and white, but I could perceive the thick texture of her lipstick. She was beautiful. She died sometime in the 40s when he was a boy. I remember my mom saying something about alcohol. Or was it pills? I know that Bob's mom is, is buried at Forest Lawn, and Bob went alone each year to visit her grave around her birthday. He brought her roses. Bob's father remarried Geneva, a woman who wore polyester leisure suits. Bob hated Geneva. He talked about her like she was an evil Disney queen sulked like a scolded schoolboy in her presence and never referred to her as his stepmother, only if he had to as his father's wife. 
the irony. <laughs> when we got home from the flower market that Saturday, Bob laid the roses on our round kitchen table. He found two glass vases under the sink and filled them with water. Then he set a trash can next to the table and grabbed two pairs of scissors, the kind with the orange handles. He handed one pair to me and got to work with the other. The flowers came with all their leaves and thorns intact. So Bob showed me how to prune them with uncharacteristic patience. First, hold the rose stem just under the bud where the thorns are very small and won't prick your fingers. Then cut diagonally about a half inch from the bottom of the stem so the rose can suck in more water. Next, cut each leaf from the stem and finally cut away each thorn from the bottom up until the stem is smooth. At first I was worried that I would prune the roses wrong and Bob would yell at me. Maybe he did and it was just so normal for him to yell that I don't remember. Or maybe he didn't. Maybe the work and the roses calmed him, calmed us both. Because for the next 15 minutes we worked quietly and in concert, tra transferring each flower to one of the vases until we had 12 roses in each. When we were done, he unwrapped the baby's breath and arranged it in the middle of each vase with the roses surrounding it. An old fashioned arrangement even back then. But this is the way I've arranged flowers ever since to this day. I cut each stem diagonally, I cut the leaves. If they are roses, I cut the thorns. I add the baby's breath last. Bob left me with the faint imprint of a Saturday spent with my stepfather the only father I've ever known. When my mother got home, she saw the first dozen red roses on the kitchen table. The second vase he played on the, placed on the dining room table where we ate dinner. I was the one who insisted we eat in the dining room, which I had seen people do in movies, rather than crammed into the corner of our house's tiny eat-in kitchen. The flowers in the center of the table meant it was hard for us to see each other during dinner. Once my mom was home from work, Bob and I returned to our corners. We hated each other once more and were jealous of each other for my mom's love. Despite efforts to save it, the Ambassador Hotel was torn down in 2006. Bob died 10 years later in October 2016. His father had lived to be 95, so his death surprised me. But if I had been paying closer attention, it wouldn't have. He and my mother had been divorced for years, but I had loosely stayed in touch with his kids from his previous marriage. And so, I saw Bob a few months before he died at a summer barbecue. He had lost a lot of weight and was listless and slumping as he met my two-year-old son, who stared up at him, silent and unafraid. Later, my husband Alan told me that while I was talking to someone else at the party, he and Bob had a conversation over hot dogs. How you been, Bob? Alan asked. Oh, well, you know, my doctor found something. He says he wants to run some tests, but I don't know. Alan urged him to follow his doctor's orders, and Bob grunted noncommittally. The three of us, Alan, me, and my little son, left soon after. That was the last time I saw Bob. Um, I went to his funeral and saw his gray casket lowered into the ground. I thought of his body inside, decomposing so near to the soil, yet cut off from the dirt and the worms it could be enriching. At the reception, they displayed a photo of him wearing a cowboy hat and a big metal belt buckle, standing in front of a mountain or Yosemite, somewhere like that. There was another picture of him at work on his car, hood popped open. No pictures of him gardening, though, and no one mentioned his roses. Bob raised roses, a whole language in the backyard that I didn't understand. I wonder who else Bob could have loved and what else Bob could have raised if he was capable of the kind of tenderness for people that he had for his garden. Thank you. Maggie Frank Zoo, everybody. Maggie.